when we get into that layer of DA, and DNA information that is starting to really build up, how would we layer that into the record keeping and the record dissemination and the diagnostician needs, et cetera? I'll be happy to start with that. I'm the second human sequenced in the Human Genome Project. So you'll find this a little strange, but as part of that project, I had to make my DNA public domain. So today, if you go to personalgenomes.org, you just click on the button, get data, you can download my genome, download my medical record, and see a view of every disease that I'm likely to develop in my life. And that, of course, was in the interest of science. The way we would do it in a hospital is we would store those aspects of your genomic markers that are going to be influential in the way a therapeutic affects your disease or in your, we'll call it probability of developing a disease. So when my wife had three stage three of breast cancer, she was sequenced and her tumor was sequenced to understand what the tumor was likely going to be susceptible to, in her case, adriamycin and cytoxin and taxol, but what her body would likely be able to tolerate. And so in this case, Hemonc Care today is using genomic markers extensively to select meds and to dose meds. Challenges, I mean, I have three billion base pairs. You have three billion base pairs. So we store three billion base pairs in our medical record. What's the doctor going to do with that? ATGC, you know. <laughs> and so it's probably more useful to store things like, in my case, give you some examples. I am more susceptible to tuberculosis than the average person should be because of a translocation of a base pair. I am twice as likely to develop prostate cancer as the average male. I carry the severe combined immunodeficiency syndrome, or boy, in a bubble disease never expressed in me or my family. But so if you store those biomarkers, those probabilities, and the doc looks and says, ah, boy, you know, it's PSA went from 0.4 to 4. PSA isn't a great test, but combine that with the probability of prostate cancer, I think we better check into that. So we're building our electronic health record systems to store more biomarkers for decision support than the three billion base pairs themselves. Hi, I have a question about um, the divide. All of the things that you've spoken about um, all of the devices, um, all of the, the patient alerts, and all the rest of it, make an assumption about access and usability of technology. All right, so old techno parts, you know, can't can't get it, uh, can't get their their smartphone to work. Um, poor people. Um, what's being done to address these kinds of divides to make your objectives real? Well, some of these issues will be very hard to alleviate, I admit. Uh, as for people with lower incomes, we are providing subsidized cell phones to people, which can definitely receive text messages. And with many applications, we are offering a fail-safe interface involving text messages so people can get texted reminders to go to their doctor's appointment or texted reminders to take a medication. So that's how we're helping that population. Uh, as for the elderly, it's a bit hard to address if they're not comfortable using technology, but we still are maintaining uh, telephonic support. We can talk to people, and we can often uh, use an automated call to reach out to someone, have a voice talk to them, but not necessarily have a human involved in the process. Right, and so to your point, whenever we register a patient for care, we ask, what is your communication preference? And it can be three at the moment. Fully electronic, where we're sending messages to your smartphone, interacting with personal health records. Voice, where we'll use robotic call systems for interactive, interactive voice response. Or paper. We will send a piece of paper to your home in an envelope if that is what you prefer. So we communicate with your preferences. We also study the Medicaid population. What we actually found was, although home internet connections aren't ubiquitous, the Medicaid population has a surprising amount of texting capability. So you're right, not for everyone, doesn't address the techno uh, phobe or the person who doesn't like text. I don't like text. Uh, but you can use texting as an effective way to send alerts and reminders to a very large number of the population. Dr. Long, you talked about uh, 
clinical decision support and how the rules at the IDMC um, really should be nationalized. Is there a roadmap for that, or what would one look like if that existed? Sure, so I've contributed all of our rules to the public domain. We've got about 2,000 rules, but uh, at a national level, there is a great activity called the Health E-Decisions Initiative. And, of course, it's closed today because it is a government <laughs> program. But its intent was to develop the standards by which a curated national repository of knowledge could be queried. And there were two sets of standards. One is, you know, what if I want a raw knowledge? You know, how do I get that back and forth? But the other, what if I just want an answer? How do I send a question? and get an answer to that question. So just Google health E decisions and you'll find out all about it. And then, and then we'll go up there. Is there any um, evidence that any of this technology will uh, help a patient stop smoking cigarettes or lose weight? What is the patient's responsibility in all of this? Because uh, People that uh, don't want to stop smoking or lose weight, this, none of this technology will do anything. Well, um, most certainly. And uh, I mean, the technologies only can really work if people are motivated to use them. That being said, the technologies can be paired with financial incentives by the employer or otherwise to do these activities. Uh, there are a number of employer based wellness programs surrounding weight loss where people can receive uh, reduced premiums, for instance, or a gift card in exchange for losing weight. And so there are external incentives that can be used to motivate people. Okay, so gamification sometimes works. Uh, if you talk to a primary care doctor and you say, what's the hardest thing to do? Change a patient's body mass index. Now, in my case, I used to weigh 70 pounds more than I do now. And my physician, oh, about 15 years ago, said, don't worry, we'll fix you beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, Lipitor, we're going to give you $700 a month of metabolic poisons. <laughs> to which I said, oh, I think I'll probably change my lifestyle. How about that? To which he responded to your point, well, that never works. <laughs> You're going to lose 25 pounds, but then gain 35. And so being a physician, you know, I'm kind of a competitive person. I came back six months later, vegan and haven't had caffeine in 15 years and lost 70 pounds. And so, yeah, maybe it was a personality-driven thing. So here's what I suggest we do. Align incentives. You guys get all safe driving discounts. How about safe eating discounts? And that is your insurance as a vegan, $500 a year. You want to go to the Capitol Grill? How about it? $5,000 a year. So you sort of wonder if although we all have skin in the game of healthcare, if you start aligning your cost of healthcare, your co-pays or your insurance, with aspects of lifestyle choice, combined with peer pressure, I think that'll work. And we've already uh, really had people put more skin in the game. We've seen our deductibles go up tremendously. Our co-pays have gone up tremendously. And as a result, people really are responsible for much more of their first dollar expenditures on various health problems. Uh, so, for instance, if they have a you know, respiratory illness as a result of their smoking, they're much more likely now to personally have to pay the cost of that than have their employer bear the cost of that. Can, can I just, I, I, how do you go, let me just follow up quickly on that. I mean, how do you both feel about this notion of um, people potentially having to pay more, for example, if they don't, you know, they, we have this information, people, People get educated on how their lifestyle needs to change. They don't. Their insurance goes up. They have to pay more. I mean, this kind of goes against, you know, the whole notion of community rating that we used to have that people felt was it was moral to make everyone pay the same amount. Um, so how do you how do you both personally feel about that? Some of this technology is going to lead to insurance companies, for example, saying or employers like CBS now makes everyone register their body mass index or they get they have to pay money every employee um, you know are there issues here that, that disturb you at all about the use of this technology for that kind of stuff there's really a fine line between trying to read underwrite people in an environment of no underwriting which we now have uh, starting in 2014 uh, versus providing people wellness incentives and we're going to have to work carefully not to cross that line especially as we enter an era in which we don't see underwriting uh, in other states, all of Massachusetts. So you're right. It's a tough 
problem. In urban areas, we have a lot of food deserts. So I could say, well, you know, I eat a lot of broccoli. Wonderful. You can't buy broccoli in many urban settings, but you can buy Pringles. So hmm, you're right. It's sort of an unfair issue there if you have no access to low-calorie <coughs> vegetable-type foods. But I wonder. I mean, sometimes I encounter patients who say, I want to eat ribs for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, smoke two packs a day, and drink heavily because I know there are pills that will counter the side effects of doing that. <laughs> and then, of course, you would prescribe Prilosec and a variety of other pills, and there are side effects to those pills, and they get pills for the side effects to the side effects, and before you know it, they're on eight medications with this horrible lifestyle, gaining weight, getting diabetes. You just wish there was sort of an incentive, whether that was monetary peer pressure that said, you know, if you just ate right, you wouldn't need the pills to begin with. All right, so I have more of a safety question, because last week our lecture was all on patient safety. And John, I think you had mentioned the concept of the scanner for your wristband. Um, and I can only help but remember I saw a segment on the Today Show, which was talking about your mobile device is has more germs on it than your hands after you go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I can't help but think that that type of device would cause issues in terms of patient safety, because we were talking in class with Professor Hawk about how many unnecessary medical errors there are. So do you have any suggestions for how you keep a device like that sterile? <laughs> 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 I, I do. Hard, so. so although Apple will tell you that the retina display should never be swabbed with alcohol, uh, we actually do it between every patient. And so the emergency department of Israel Dignas runs on iPads. And you take an iPad out of a safe, you use it on your shift, and as you walk from one room to the next, you disinfect it with alcohol. And that's worked just fine for us. We're piloting Google Glass. And Google Glass is a wearable <coughs> computer. So the idea is, as you start your shift, you put on the glasses. As you walk into a patient room, you see all the data about the patient in your field of vision. You never have to touch it. You never have to take it off, move it. You can use your hands, which are sterile, to examine the patient or do a procedure. And all of your computing is basically part of your body. So that's another thing we're looking at. Great discussion tonight. I was wondering what the state of the standards are for electronic uh, record exchange between hospitals. You got two hours. <laughs> so I'll give you the capsule summary. 2,000 pages of federal regulations in two minutes or less. This meaningful use program in 2014, this is the next stage of meaningful use, includes some very specific standards for the content of a summary record. Your problems, your meds, your allergies, your labs, your diet, the care plan. And this is all put in a relatively modern construct. It's similar to what a Facebook or Google or Amazon would use for internal communications. And that is required of every electronic health record for every doctor and every hospital to transmit a summary about you. We finished most of the vocabularies in medicine so that doctors can speak the same language as to medications and problems and allergies and labs, because I may call it a CBC, but you call it a hemogram. We've unified that language. The National Library of Medicine has made the unified language available for free to every user in the United States from something called their Value Center Authority Center. And lastly, we've agreed on a transmission protocol to get data from place to place. How is it I can take the payload about you and send it to the next provider of care and ensure it's not modified or intercepted, except from the NSA? That we can't take it. <laughs> from place to place, and it is a cryptographic secure mechanism that is a variation on secure email protocols. And that's continuing to evolve. So by the time we get to the 2016 next set of standards, they'll even be simpler and more Facebook and Google-like. But in 2014, I think we've got a pretty good set, so the standards are no longer the problem. Uh, I'd like to go back on two questions and, and build on something you started on, and that was the uh, one of the statistics that has grabbed me for some time is that 
something like 50% of our nation's health care costs are uh, due to self-induced problems, uh, eating pork chops back in the day, that kind of thing. Uh, we started to, to get more on that and we seemed to get a little frustrated with what the heck can we do about it. But gosh, when half of the nation's health care costs are, are due to those self-inflicted injuries, uh, it's just, just crazy that, that we don't do more. We really live in an era of risk shifting. So we're increasingly seeing the risk of the medical expenditure be shifted from the payer to either the employer, the patient, or the provider. And as a result, we're seeing a new set of tools be developed within these organizations to reduce that risk. Uh, on the provider side, ACOs have more financial responsibility uh, towards a person's illnesses. And as a result, as we saw, they, they create problem lists and are working to more proactively monitor people's health status to prevent the, the diabetic from not getting the care they don't need, uh, to make sure they get the foot exam they should be having. And so we're seeing more conscientiousness there. The employers have been investing in wellness programs because ultimately they know if a person's been working for them for several years, they're going to own that person's long-term health risk. Likewise with individuals. We're in really in an era of high deductible health plans. People are paying more of the direct cost of their health care than ever before. And as people get shifted towards the exchanges, and I think in many states they will, even more people will have high deductible health plans in which they own a lot of the first dollar cost of their health care. And some individuals, too, will be financially aligned uh, with the interest of reducing their health care expenditures. So I guess the way I see this problem getting solved in the short term is by the various stakeholders that have ownership of these risks working to prevent the risks from becoming problems. Alignment of incentives, you said it pretty well. Uh, it used to be we were paid fee for service. In fact, if you came to the emergency department three times, I get paid three times. Fabulous. You know, get a country club <coughs> membership. In the world of accountable care, I actually don't want to see you in the emergency department because it becomes a cost rather than a payment to the hospital. So what are we doing this year? We've invested $7 million in health care coaches, home care nurses, and care management. So the story I heard yesterday was at the conference we were at was you take a diabetic who's been eating Krispy Kremes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, is 30 pounds overweight, smokes too much, and doesn't exercise at all. You give that person a personalized health coach, a relationship with a home care provider, suddenly they actually want to care for themselves. There's somebody who cares about them. And so we have seen with these interventions of providing someone in your home who reviews activities of daily living, helps you with diet counseling, and cares about you, you actually can change some behavior. So, you know, we'll try the care management part of accountable care. That in combination, as you say, with some of the alignment of financial incentives may help. We're trying. Thank you. You've spoken to the um, uh, data sharing at the state level and at the federal. What's the status globally? That's sort of interesting. As you go to every country, you'll see they're trying to solve the same problems we are. But so let me give you some examples. So Sweden divides uh, the country into 36 county councils. One of the great things about Sweden is it's one payer health care, but every county council is responsible for the health of its citizens. If it invests a dollar in M Health, but it saves two, it keeps the difference. So there's a lot of incentive for innovation. And the Swedish people, it's a cultural thing, think it is their public duty to share their data because it is society that is keeping them healthy. So this issue of privacy and restrictions of data flow, it just doesn't exist in Sweden. So you got a lot of investment, a lot of innovation, and sort of cultural sensitivity to share it. Now contrast that with China. I'm going to be there next week. We're going to share your data. And you will like it. <laughs> <laughs> and so society there feels like, mm, if I don't share my data, I'm going to get a visit in the middle of the night. So, so they are sharing data there in kind of a forced fashion. Japan, no hospitals connected to the internet. They think it's a security risk. There's no sharing of data with anyone for error, any reason in Japan. You know, take a country like Denmark or Scotland. You know, these countries that are just a couple million people, they've built 
nationwide data sharing systems because the populations are small enough that it's actually not a scale problem. India has a situation somewhere in between. So I go to India every March, and there are all these private hospital chains that often contain multiple multi-specialty hospitals in different cities. Each hospital has some of the specialties, but not all of them. They want to share data to keep people within the brand. They have an economic incentive to share data between the hospitals within the company system because they don't want people to go to the better. And to the extent that it becomes harder for people to get the information they need within the other allied hospitals within the health system, uh, they'll lose money. And so there, you have a private market. You have really a lot of very loose regulation of data sharing. And you still see sharing occurring. And India also has a very interesting model, which is the patient owns the record, not the doctor. So the patient carries the record from doctor to doctor, and the doctors then make notes in it. And of course, that's something that we in this country are trying to move toward. That is, you should be able to be the steward of your own data, sharing it as you will. But in general, there's no country that has really solved this completely well to the scale, certainly, of 330 million people that we have. Okay. How about like France to the US, that kind of sharing? Yeah, so Are well, we anywhere near that? Well, uh, so there's sort of two problems. Uh, we try to pick standards, to your point, that are actually international standards. They're not US standards. Yeah. So when you say blood pressure in French and blood pressure in, the, in English, it's actually the same concept identifier. So that's not so much the issue. But there's a lot of interesting international privacy law, sort of a policy problem. Uh, recently, I signed an agreement for a patient and family engagement Mo M Health site from a company in Canada. And they turned out they're going to have to move their data center to New Jersey because I can't send data, even with your consent, across international boundary. And there's some interesting legal challenge. So what I would rather do is rather than solve every international legal problem, every country gives the data to you, and then you share it as you will. Thank you. Um, maybe one or two more questions? I have another question about insurance. <laughs> I don't understand why we need medical insurance. Insurance is a concept that works for fire or theft, where a lot of people pay in, but there are very few payouts, relatively speaking. Everybody goes to see the doctor. Insurance companies suck up 30% of the health care dollar. You mentioned that uh, we're spending 16, 17% of the GDP on health care. Right. Frankly, I don't know what the right number should be. Maybe it should be 25 percent. Should be eight or eight. Well, whatever. <laughs> you know the number that I don't. Know. But I don't understand why we can't get rid of insurance companies and have medical care care paid for via tax dollars and give everybody a little card. <laughs> so, but you want to start with that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so first of all, thanks to the lovely MLR requirements. In the Commonwealth, I believe 88% of the dollar goes to actual medical care. Across the nation, it's about 85%, depending on the type of plan a person has. And having worked at an insurer myself, I can say that I know that insurers work hard to fight fraud and abuse. Not all medical care that's delivered is really necessary or helpful medical care. Some is, but some is not. And insurers have the unique ability to see across provider organizations and also to try to make sure that we don't have unnecessary or fraudulent medical spending. So in answer to your question, and I would take a, say a cynical view, which is if our Congress can't even decide to open the government, <laughs> trying to take what is a very powerful industry with a lot of stakeholders and constituents and radically change it is hard. So you sure, you look at a lot of models across the world where they've decided it is an economic appropriate thing to tax the citizenry and provide single-payer health care, then, you know, it works in many places. And sometimes there is uh, a long wait. So in the UK, I was cycling in East Anglia, and I went into a pub, and there was a gentleman who was limping. And I said, yeah, it looks like you got a sore hip. He said, well, I saw my GP, and he told me it would be six months to see an orthopedist, but I can pay 60 pounds and see him tomorrow. So he paid the 60 pounds. And the orthopedist said, you need a hip replacement. Now, you can have that in six years or pay 6,000 pounds and have it tomorrow. So you do have sometimes in some countries, because they have kind of a fixed budget, 
access to care may not be quite so perfect, but I think we all agree that there are certain inefficiencies in a thousand different insurance companies, with a thousand different boardrooms, and a thousand different leases, that you'd like to get to something a little bit simpler. Okay, on that note, I think we will, it's a good place to stop. Um, I'd like to uh, thank both of our...